Soul Journey with Hashima Moja, an inspiring and thought-provoking program filled with music and stories that can help you to recognize, reflect upon, and embrace your own How's everybody doing? Welcome to the Soul Germ. <clears throat> I'm really excited about this week's show, and I, and I hope that uh, as we get into this program this week, that you all pay very close attention because I'm really excited and I'll be introducing or bringing on in just a few minutes a very special guest, Dr. Anahi Douglas, who is an assistant professor in the Department of English at SUNY uh, Old Westbury, where she teaches courses in 20th and 21st century American U.S. multi-ethnic and world literature. And we're going to be talking more about her work. But today, as we enter into this episode, I've been thinking with everything going on in the world around us about how the word love comes up quite often. The concept of love and even how some people appropriate the term love in order to help them to avoid dealing with the deeper issues in our country. The word love being used as a, as a way of avoiding or deflecting from having to look inward and really deal with the hard issues of race and white supremacy in our country. And I know that The Sojourn is a show that focuses on looking inward, reflecting critically on our own journeys. But of course, what good is it to reflect, reflect critically if we can't connect our own inner work to the world around us? So I was reading a, a quote earlier today and I wanted to share it with you. It's from the great Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. And the quote says, to love is to recognize. To be loved is to be recognized by the other. If you love someone and you continue to ignore his or her presence, this is not true love. And so I was thinking about this quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, who's one of my favorite uh, writers, speakers. And I was thinking about how so many people talk about the fact that we just need to love, that we just need to love one another. And that sounds wonderful. And, and I'm not even saying that it's not true because it's very true. Love is a powerful force. But then I was thinking about that word love and juxtaposing it with the reality of the world that we live in. Here in the States, for instance, and I know that we have people watching from around the world. So here specifically in the United States, we have people who practice many different types of faiths. And there are so many people who practice their faith kind of in a vacuum. It means that they may attend their church or their temple or their mosque, but not always necessarily grasp the essence of what those visits to the church or the temple or the mosque might really mean and then connect them to the larger society. So I was thinking about this, uh, this scripture that said, if anyone says I love God yet hates his brother, he is a liar. I know I probably just made some people mad, but that's okay. 
I do that. For anyone who does not love his brother who he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You and I, anybody who knows me and has been watching the sojourn for any length of time knows that I always talk about the fact that we are divinity. We are divine creatures walking in flesh. And so how is it possible to claim that you love God or follow a particular religion, but you can't love the man or the woman who's right in front of you? Because as part of the human family, all of us are brothers and sisters. And I think that it really points to a larger issue. And as we start to talk about this for a minute, I'm going to lead you into a guided meditation. How is it possible to love others if we don't love ourselves? And so I think that the fact that we see so much hatred and so much fear of the other, that throughout the history of the United States, the stories, the lives, and the realities of black and brown people have been ignored, have been erased, or at least the attempt has been made to erase the narratives, the stories, the truths, the realities that black and brown people live every day. And yet someone might go to a church and say that they are a believer in God who claims to be love, right? And I think that this really points to the fact that we're suffering as a society from a lack of self-love and that to fear the other is really admitting that we fear ourselves. We fear our own divinity, our own greatness, and we fear looking inside. To recognize and to truly love means to understand. You can't have love if you don't have understanding. And the only way that we can truly understand is to learn to deeply listen. And at this time, at this juncture in our history, those people who are called white need to be able to sit with the deep and uncomfortable feelings that come by listening to the stories and the realities of those who are your brothers of a darker hue. For those of you who claim to be meditators, whether you are Buddhist or Taoist or atheist, doesn't matter. For those of you who are meditators, so often we take the practice of meditation and we appropriate it to our own needs or our own benefit, if you will. And so we try to use meditation as a way to escape when the reality is that the power and the truth of meditation is really based upon learning to be more present to those uncomfortable feelings that may arise as we sit with those truths that are resting in us. For, for my brothers who are identified as black or other people of color, the opportunity to sit in meditation and to begin to heal the racial trauma that rests at the cellular level is very important in order to begin to work to imagine and create a new world. So what I'd like to do before I introduce today's guest is to invite you all to sit with me for just a few minutes, remembering as we meditate on for just a moment on the idea of listening and love.
breathing in deeply. love is to recognize and to be loved is to be recognized by the other breathing in I'm here in this present moment I'm here in this present moment. Breathing in. I'm here in this present moment. Breathing out, I'm here in this present moment. that makes it difficult for you to sit with the uncomfortable feeling of just listening to someone's truth, not trying to fix it. Not trying to apologize, to sit with your feelings of discomfort. those uncomfortable feelings come out that I might be mentioning. What do they bring up for you? What's, what's occurring? Make note of those feelings because that's where the work starts. As I talk to my brothers and sisters who identify as black or identify as a member of another group of color. I constantly hear, we don't need white people to save us. We need white people to work on themselves and to work on other white people. You might not hear this in your yoga class or your meditation class because some people have appropriated the practice force or to avoid dealing with their difficulties there, difficulties that they have with issues of race, and white supremacy. Finally, to my brothers and sisters who identify as black or as a member of another group of color, as you sit, 
what are the things that you are carrying that are heavy for you? We're going to talk a little bit today about trauma echoes and racialized trauma. What are some of the deep traumas that you carry that no one knows about that you need to release? Breathing in and breathing out, become aware of those feelings. Become aware of what you carry. Learn to sit with those feelings because as all types of people around the world work toward dismantling racism and white supremacy, we have to understand that there's a balance between focusing on the outward and focusing on the inward. As we dismantle outwardly, we also must dismantle inwardly the systems and the emotional knots that hold us tied up, that stay tied up inside of us and hold us prisoner so that we can begin to imagine and begin to create a new world. <clears throat> Thank you for participating in that meditation with me. And so with that, I'd like to introduce a very special guest, Dr. Anahi Douglas, assistant professor in the Department of English at SUNY Old Westbury, where she teaches courses in 20th and 21st century American literature, US multi-ethnic and world literature. And get ready for this. You have to prepare for all of this. I have to take a breath before I try to say it all. Dr. Douglas's interdisciplinary <laughs> research engages 20th and 21st century American literature and culture, the African diaspora and African American expatriation, along with other things. Her current research analyzes border narratives in the US applying post-Marxist and critical race theory to, to critique 20th century film and 21st century hip hop. <sighs> Welcome. Dr. Anahi Douglas, how are you? I'm great, thank you, how are you? I'm great, thank you so much for being here. So, obviously, we probably could do a whole series of shows together um, just to talk about your work. And what I'm interested first in doing is just giving you a little time to let the audience know who you are, a little bit about your journey and and what brought you from where you started to where you find yourself currently? Who is Dr. Anahi Douglas? Um, I'm the mother's daughter. <laughs> and I say that jokingly, but really, I'm, I'm shaped so much by um, my maternal ancestry. Uh, so I'm uh, Afro Chicana. Um, my father was a white American and met my mother, and eventually, uh, my mother moved to the United States. and was born and raised in Ankeny, Iowa. Yep, Iowa. There are Latinos in Iowa. Go stick to life. <laughs> yeah, there's a small Latino population. Um, I lived there until I was 21 years old. And I decided I wanted to transfer and finish my college degree in New York City. I thought, well, where can I make it really tough? Hmm, I'll check New York. <laughs> <laughs> and I moved here and you know, I'm, a first, I'm a second generation American. Um, and a first generation college student, my family, so I took the logical choice, which is I was going to major in business. Oh. I took another English course, and I thought, oh, I can't shake it. I love this. So I transferred to Hunter College, majored in English, um, had some tremendous mentorships in the, in the way of professors and advisors and programs that helped me realize that I had the chops to get into a PhD program. So from um, completing my uh, a BA in English, I um, was accepted to the CUNY Graduate Center, and I completed my doctorate in English. I was with a certificate in American Studies in May of 2018. So, oh, and then um, I've been teaching along the way. That has that's impacted a lot of um, 
my research, but also how I engage, I think about like practice, like how do we deliver and how do we make what we research actually affect change in, I mean, how do we change the world that we can change our corner of it? So student, mm -hmm. um, student relationships and mentoring and being mentored and being a mentor to others has been really like a fundamental part of who I see myself as. And again, as my mother's daughter, my mother is an outreach worker. So it's my way of giving back both um, intellectually and, and spiritually to the community. So you were raised with it. You were raised with the example of a person who was invested in the idea of community. Oh yeah, we couldn't get out of it anyway if we tried. We were, you know, volunteered by my mom. So <laughs> uh, we were always active. Uh, there's a community group in Des Moines called Latinos Unidos, and that's a group that my mother helped to um, found. And we were very active in in that community. So it was something that was instilled in us from an early age, my mother grew up um, grew very, very, very poor, but she never took for granted where she came from and, and what she's achieved. And it's always about giving back and paying for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, everything you've told me about your mother and even mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, the pictures on social media, you with your mom, <laughs> you know, you and I have shared conversations where we're, we're in the headspace, we're cerebral, but then, <laughs> I see those pictures of you with your mom, <clears throat> or even you just talking about your mom and your whole countenance seems to change, you know? So it's it's evident that her presence in your life has been a very powerful shaping force, you know? And it's very clear the the deep amount of love that you all and, and the bond that you share with each other. So that's that's a beautiful thing. For me, that's a liberating thing in and of itself, I think. You know, particularly when we look at some of the narratives that we see about people of color in our society, mm -hmm. we're hearing these narratives that are really wrapped up in white guilt, white supremacy, the idea of, well, yeah, you know, these poor people of color, they all come from broken homes and they all come from mm -hmm. so these narratives. So I think that it's a powerful thing just to see love in action right, within, within families that are generally the subject of narratives that they're not writing or not telling themselves. These are people telling other people's stories, right? Exactly, so it's so important to have our stories told coming from our own perspective, but like these family relationships, these strong family bonds, not only is that depicting an accurate panorama, because you know, people of color, Latinos, Chicanos, we're, we're not a monster. We all have our own, um, our own narratives, but that also can help to heal intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. um, building those bonds and like addressing the and trying to um, heal, suture those scars, and, mm -hmm. and for the better of you know your children and your children's children and just our community broadly. Yeah, you know, I was I was thinking so as we were discussing <clears throat> when I when I invited you on the show. Um, you know, you threw this, you threw this idea out of talking about education as self-care mm -hmm. and, you know, we hear the term self-care kind of thrown around and it means different things to everybody, but talk a little bit about what you mean when you talk about education as self-care and of course you 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 gave me a longer phrase right <laughs> self-care in the context of this particular pedagogical idea mm -hmm. right but what do you mean when you talk about education as as self-care well having our histories told um honoring where we come from not you know, not reading one standard text about history. You know, what's like the old saying, like there's our side, there's our side, and there's what's that really happened. So he, right. reading those narratives, being exposed to a broad range of narratives, um, whether they be fiction, um, oral tradition, music, history, uh, and like valuing where we come from and having our backgrounds and our cultures and our languages legitimized, not to say they weren't legitimate, but what we've seen so often um, you know, in education, have been some organization. Just 
and mm -hmm. act as though that history doesn't exist or it's not worthwhile telling. Um, and I think like one thing I try to impress upon my students is that education is the one thing that no one can ever take away from you. Mm -hmm. So to align, particularly for people of color, to be able to align our, our histories, our stories, our tradition, to value it, um, also helps us value ourselves and who we are and to stand proud um, and carry that with us and, and pass it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I also think something that you mentioned, the idea of having, when we talk about having our language or our stories or our culture, our experiences legitimized um, in, the, in the Western academic model, you know, there's this idea that if, if, it's, if it doesn't fit into the context of empiric, Western empirical data, that it's not legitimate, meaning if it's not written down, if it's not traceable, if it's not verifiable according to the standards of Western mm -hmm. um, academia, then it's not valid. But there's a, there's a great scholar out of, I believe, the University of Texas, Dr. Laura Rendon, and she, she wrote or teaches now, because she's a professor emeritus, but <clears throat> she teaches about the concept of senti pensante, the, the, the pedagogy of thinking mm -hmm. and feeling, mm -hmm. where she focuses a lot of her research and a lot of her, her teaching and a lot of her writing around centering indigenous knowledge. Yeah. And the fact that our oral histories are as valid mm -hmm. and as important and as powerful as if we were reading a Western, uh, a Western, a book out of the Western tradition, a history out of the Western tradition, out of the European tradition, because so many of our histories are oral, yeah. they're passed down. And so the idea of centering indigenous knowledge is, is I think really an important one to, to tie into this conversation. And you know, how can, how can oral histories heal us? I come at it in, in two ways. I think we can also, I certainly agree, but we don't have to be ethnographers to do this. We as brothers and sisters and, and students and whether or not we are in the academy, um, right. just by asking for our family's histories, tell me that story, or you know, just to sit back and to listen. I started recording, I mean, also I am an academic, so you know, that's <laughs> I started recording some of these these um, family histories that I have been passed down to um, me from my mother. Um, but I also think about like music as another um, we're, like a receptacle for these histories. So I was uh, in graduate school. I studied the history of the blues. So for me, this mm -hmm. is a form of storytelling. Um, it has you know roots going back to the African diaspora in terms of instrumentation, call and response. Um, but in particular, when we think about like the 1890s, this first wave, wave of blues musicians, this is the first time you know black men have access to mobility and they're telling stories about their travels and freedom. And, mm -hmm. and you know the blues, is, I, to me, I think the blues is profound, and that's another way of connecting with these stories that were ordinarily written down, and even when they were recorded, even by you know like um, Lomaxes. Yeah, yep. was very problematic as well. Um, so I think we can look at it, and it's all about what, how the individual connects. For me, it's family. Um, you know, as writing as I was writing my dissertation, I had a picture of my great grandpa Santiago and my great grandma Tomasa, who were alive during the Mexican Revolution. And I'm writing about the, you know this period, so I connected the academic with the personal. Um, but it's about what, what calls to us. So for me, you know, again, music literature, history, but we just, we have to make it our own. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm also thinking about something that, that we were having a discussion about in preparation mm -hmm. for, for this program. And that's the idea of the imposter syndrome. And so you mm -hmm. mentioned in your introduction, <laughs> how what an important role mentors played in your in your mm -hmm. academic progress right yeah. um 
And of course, for those, first of all, let people know who might not know what imposter syndrome is, what that actually is, or, or a brief summary of that. And then, so how did that play out in your life? And how does it seem to play out in the lives, maybe of, of students of color in particular, as we kind of look at it against now the, the mirror of white supremacy and in institutions? Okay. Um, a quick definition of, of imposter syndrome from, from my perspective is not having confidence in oneself. Um, of course, you know, people can go on the other hand and, and be too confident, but when there's this fundamental lack of confidence in oneself and their voice and their worthiness to be in a space that they belong, it becomes inhibiting. Um, it stops a lot of students from being um, more intellectually curious, from, you know, literally raising their hand, asking questions, and, you know, taking on in more intense and demanding research. So mm -hmm. that certainly was the case for me. Um, I, you know, my family always told me I was smart, but I didn't have that social capital. I mm -hmm. didn't know how to apply to, you know, to colleges. I didn't know what graduate school was like. You know, I didn't know I was gonna do these, these degrees. So, um, and because of mentorship, I was guided. I had, um, you know, uh, Dr. Jeff Allred at Hunter College is the first person that really like tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, you're really good at this, you know, let me help you. Because um, also like, you think about academic writing, it's a certain style. And it takes a long time to be up, up to snuff. And like, even to this day, I've been editing old articles and papers and stuff. And maybe like a year or two old, and I still see that I'm developing as a writer. That's just something I hopefully for everyone we continue to work on. So he helped me. Um, I was also accepted to the Ronald uh, McNair program and the community pipeline program that help underrepresented uh, students apply for the PhD program. I know mm -hmm. it's as simple as explaining, you know, what a personal statement is, how long it should be and going guiding through the process to, you know, receiving um, GRE classes, which, which really helped improve my GRE score over the course of the summer. Um, it's literally like walking us through, um, like we visited Harvard, Yale, the Community Graduate Center, like being in these spaces that are upward or just would be really intimidating um, for a lot of people just being in the space. Uh, so that was, that got me into graduate school, but then once I get to graduate school, you know, Everyone in the room was really smart. And I probably spent the first year just sh like shuddered inside, so afraid to say anything, just doubted myself. You know, I was coming in with a, ba a bachelor's degree into a PhD program, didn't speak. I thought my writing was horrible. And then I took a class with uh, Dr. Jerry Watts, Brother Watts, and he really looked out for students, um, you know, regardless of you know their politics he looked for the um the underdog and he mm. saw me someone who was timid and luckily it was a smaller seminar so i would speak more often and you know he graduated he earned his phd in 1975 from Yale, um, a man of color he mm -hmm. understood those hurdles and so for him it was always all about paying forward and, and looking out for those students that need the extra guidance that you know can't afford the book, but he has it, or you know whatever he could do to help into to help develop one intellectually, and also to encourage them to have courage to see the strength in themselves. To you know, what I maybe would thought think of as a vulnerability, by like, you know being a second generation American. He's like, no, that's a strength. And so he influenced me to, to look at you know my family's journey. And that got me to the point of researching African-American expatriation to Mexico, because given our present context, so much of the attention has been focused on uh, migration uh, south right. to north, when in fact there's well-documented cases for centuries of African-Americans migrating south and to Mexico in particular, um, freeing themselves from enslavement of uh, oh. uh, segregation, the long term pro. Um, so 
he helped me. He didn't empower me. I empowered myself. But he got me to a point where I was able to to look in the mirror and be proud and see that there's real value in my history, my people, my culture that aside from, you know, a handful of colors hasn't been discussed. Um, and in addition, Rob Rebar was another one of my uh, mentors and he really encouraged me to look at the African diaspora in Latin America, mm. which, you know, Latin we're still struggling with owning, loving, accepting our African heritage for many of us. Um, mm -hmm. So that really pulled together this, you know, the family history, my political interests, um, and just honoring, honoring the past um, in the present and bringing those things together for me. And I found an intellectual, spiritual home in doing that. That's powerful. And, and so, you know, I hear you talking about really about issues of spatial entitlement. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and also, I think I think that your comments are, are particularly poignant right now, because as we talk about attacking and dismantling systems of white supremacy mm -hmm. in institutions, we often, we're talking about dismantling to allow access. But as I kind of said at the beginning of the show, at the top of the show, the work of healing from the trauma, the racialized mm -hmm. trauma that, that, that is a result of white supremacy and racism and imperialism and colonialism, <laughs> we could certainly get into the Marxist, right? We could get into the, <laughs> the post-Marxist analysis. But um, a lot of that work also requires that we go inside to really dismantle those systems. Audre Lorde talks quite often about how fighting white supremacy is also about examining critically the what what we have internalized from the oppressor, right? Because if tomorrow, if tomorrow we eradicated white supremacy from every system and every structure in this country and throughout the world, you know, Africa is a, is a wonderful example of what happens when people don't always necessarily do the internal work mm -hmm. because having mm -hmm. internalized colonization and uh, the European brand of racism and white supremacy, we end up with neo-colonialism. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Which manifests as colorism, which of course in Latin America, in Puerto Rico and Mexico, throughout mm -hmm. Latin America, the issue of colorism arises as one of the ways that white supremacy manifests itself in anti-blackness mm -hmm. um, and, and in a lot of other ways. And so, um, you know, I think I, I, I'm really interested. I'd love to read some some of your um, work on African American expatriation in particular, because I'm thinking about Lorraine Hansberry, who spent time in Mexico, Langston Hughes, who spent time in Mexico, and so many other. So many other ab absolutely, <laughs> so many prominent African American scholars and artists who who moved into Mexico, expatriated to Mexico, because they felt at least a certain semblance of, of freedom from the American brand of racism, not to, say that, 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 not to say that there weren't issues in Mexico related to race, <laughs> clearly, right? Mm -hmm. However, um, the issue of spatial entitlement, which is really, really important, and that's, that's kind of the way that I, I talk about what you're talking about with imposter syndrome, dealing with young people, you know, I deal with young people who walk onto college campuses and say, I don't know if this is for me. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do this. And it has to do with those things that have been internalized. And um, just real briefly, because you mentioned the word cultural capital. And again, for those who, who might not have ever heard that term, what is cultural capital and how do we, how do we apply it in, in moving forward? So I'm, you know, I'm also thinking about social capital here um, in terms of like having been socialized 
this feeling of inclusion, um, having parents who have gone to attended college, who mm. know how to apply, who know that process, that know how to apply to for financial aid, that um, can read, write, and speak English, that are documented, mm. who aren't afraid to go into these offices into these spaces where you know they feel as, as a part of an informed member of society because of their exposure and inclusion and political efficacy so many of us have lacked that and have had to learn to have had to learn ourselves or we've taught each other we've reached out to our peers and our mentors have you know really helped us guide us along the way um so and you know and this is a part of what I look to do with my students. Um, you know, you, you kind of recognize little ticks or things that it, in your how or I should say I would recognize things in my students where, you know, they don't give themselves enough credit or give up on themselves or they literally say they feel uncomfortable with going into a library. Or, I, don't, I don't know how to do this. I'm like, okay, so sure. I got you. Let's work it out. Let's figure it out. Um, right and feeling like I'm an open, that they feel comfortable enough with me as a human being to be able to, to reveal these insecurities, these fears, because it can be so limiting. Um, it can really make us feel delegitimized. And, and really it's followed up in fear and shame. And you're know, talking about love at the top of the show. What I think Baldwin, I'm gonna summarize Baldwin here. Of course. You can't love, you can't <laughs> hold love and fear in the same hand. Absolutely. Right. Um, but, and I think a part of that, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I think a lot of that process, and for me and for students, um, it's influenced my teaching, was going to graduate school, was uh, taking courses in critical race theory and learning that I'd internalized so much self hate mm. that I'd been drinking the Kool Aid. Um, yeah. And yeah. Learn, unlearning that process. So whenever I explain this to students or to peers, um, I explain it's like, so I grew up in Iowa too. So I spent a lot of time right. outside in the winter. Um, and you got to this point where like, all of a sudden your hands would be frozen. And you're like, oh no, frostbite, I have to go inside. And that process, that falling out, that feeling, mm -hmm. it hurts. We know it's really good. We don't want to lose our fingers, but in order to save them, we have to go through that painful process. And that's right. critical race theory for me of learning how I internalized and subjected this hate um, that I was taught, that was institutional, that was in, within both sides of my family. Um, sure. But then what are you left with? Definitely, me, raw meat. Well, what are you gonna do with it? You have to do something with these hands now. So whether it's, you know, you, someone takes on some social justice activism in their own community, or teachers or mentors we're just good human beings and we look at the world with love instead of that fear mm -hmm. that us versus them and that's what we do with that painful process we take something as negative and, and charge it and make it positive yeah you know i was <clears throat> i was just about to ask you the question uh, and I think this will just be more of a continuation, but for, for the people who are watching mm -hmm. right now, we have this broad cross section of people who watch. We have young people who are watching right now. We have, we have factory workers that are watching us right now. We have office workers and we have academics that are watching us. So there's this broad cross section and artists. So there's this broad cross section of people, but the majority don't necessarily possess the same academic language that you that you have acquired through your your time um, studying and and developing into Dr. Anahi Douglas. So in our current reality, because there may be some people who say, well, "Wow, all that stuff sounds great. That sounds wonderful." It's interesting. But how do I apply this? How do I apply what Dr. Douglas is talking about right now to my fight against white supremacy as maybe I participated in 
in the uprisings on the street mm -hmm. or as I deal with my boss or as I deal with my teachers, how do we take this knowledge and apply it? How do we apply everything that you've been talking about to, to real life situations? So I guess stepping out of academia, maybe a little bit into public intellectualism for a moment. I even go as far as saying as public intellectualism. It is about being a good human being, being a brother and being a sister um, to people out there in the world. And I think the first thing we have to set down and realize there is a difference between being non-racist and being actively anti-racist. And I think that is the cornerstone of where we, we can begin outside of the halls, the brick and mortar classrooms, and really mm. apply this. So this begins, it, it's not enough for someone to, not enough for someone to be like, oh, you know, I'm not racist, I'm good, I did my part. To be actively anti-racist, you have to use your voice to be an ally. We're not looking for saviors. Right. We're looking for Absolutely. an allegiance. So if you overhear someone making a remark that's cruel or in bad taste, um, calling them out on it, letting them know that it's not okay with you for them to use that language and to, to refer to a group of people in that manner, um, I think that's the very first fundamental step that we can take. And you know, making it clear that that's not cool to use that language in my presence that, you know, I think for a lot of people and like a lot of allies that I know that are, are white, they, the, uh, the presumption because they are white that they won't be offended and like really like making that clear. No, this, this offends me. Um, um, you know, listening to people's stories. So, you know, um, Spevak poses the question, can this walk and speak? Well, yeah. Wait, is anyone willing to listen? So listening to our stories of people within our community, and these are not just like token stories of this one thing. This is systemic, institutional, mm -hmm. institutional um, discrimination and racism. Oftentimes it's intersected with, you know, sexism, colorism, homophobia, transphobia. So these aren't just anecdotes. These, these, this is, a reflection of a much, much bigger um, and really detrimental, detrimental issue. Um, so listen, but like don't, but also people of color, our job isn't to teach you about racism. So right. it's knowing who to approach and using use of sensitivity and, and logic. I think also for me, it's reading and I granted, you know, it's a privilege to have access to um, to text, to be able to purchase text. We can go to public libraries. I know a public library, maybe not, not right now, um, but also digital repositories and having um, web access is also a privilege. Yep. But I think for me, understanding, like going back to Audrey Lord, and she talks about the recognition of mutual difference, that my struggle is not the same as your struggle, but I see your struggle, and so long as you're locked into that, I am too. And right. if it's for me, reading and reading literature helped open me up to these other struggles and to see how there were all like these links within these chains. And like going back you know, to, to Brother Baldwin, Giovanni's room. I've never been a white queer man in the 1950s who's expatriated to France. Right. But I, felt for him. I learned a lot about what that that feeling of being an outsider when he was supposed to be like the insider, you know, yes. upper middle class white man, and how disillusioned he was. And he was always just estranged from himself and alienated from even, you know, the, the, the queer community in France that the psychic right. toll, the emotional toll that takes. I learned more about I learned about that experience and more than I realized before having read it. So mm -hmm. read broadly, ask questions. No one to listen, be an ally. I don't think we could have ended the interview <laughs> in a more succinct way. Um, I really want to thank you. I know you're traveling currently <clears throat> uh, to be with family. Mm -hmm. 
And so I know that it was an extra sacrifice to, to take time, particularly because, you know, I know I travel for a living when you're traveling and your sleep schedule is off, you know, you're driving, right? So people should know Dr. Douglas is not on planes and trains. She's driving to where she has to go. Right. And Uh, so, (laughs) so I really, I know that it was a sacrifice, but I really appreciate, um, you know, and on a personal level, I appreciate your friendship because our, our discussions, you know, I, I usually end up leave, finishing our discussions being extremely geeked up the way I am right now um, <clears throat> because there's something powerful. There's something powerful when people own their stories and then use their own stories to help people illuminate theirs. And, and I think that that's one of the things that I know about you is that you're dedicated to this idea of helping pull out of people what's already in them. Yeah. No bank, no banking model with you. You're a frarian. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> no banking model with you. You're about pulling things out of people and, and helping them to see what's already inside of them. And and so I really want to thank you for your words. We covered a lot of ground in just over a half an hour. And I know we could cover so much more. I'll probably have to have you back on again. It would be um, my absolute pleasure. But thank you so much. Travel safely to where you have to get to, mm-hmm. um, to go be with your family, actually. And we will be talking soon. Don't go anywhere. Stay in the green room. We're going to talk mm-hmm. after. Okay. Thank you okay. so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> Dr. Anahi Douglas, everybody. Um, and, of course... Once again, she's an assistant professor in the Department of English at uh, SUNY Old Westbury. And so our time is up. I do want to thank you for joining us on The Soul Journey and let you know that next week, my guest will be Dr. Carmen Cosme, who will be talking with us about the importance of identity politics in the context of dealing with white supremacy and the identity politics of of people of color in the context of white supremacy. So you won't want to miss next week's show. Normally, I would sing a song to sing out, but my throat, in full disclosure, is uh, is a little tired today simply because with weather changes, and also not really sleeping too well. My throat's tired, and so I know that I don't have the juice today to actually sing out, but I will leave you with the words from a song that I recently uh, wrote. And it says, I wonder if we will ever be able to see beyond what we've believed for so long. Can you see the possibility that you may be wrong? And can you find the strength in yourself to admit the truth? Until next week, remember, love yourself, love others, and find the strength in yourself to do the work that you need to do to create and to live in a world that we all can enjoy and be proud of. I'll talk to you next week.